Uh, so my name is Waldemar. Uh, I'm the CTO of Locus Deck. Um, you can reach me under this um, Twitter handle or via, uh, via email. Uh, we'd be happy to, to connect with you uh, also after the conference. And I uh, also want to say thanks to the organizers for organizing such a, a great event where people can come together and uh, talk about uh, the latest developments in the, in the Python space. Um, so just a, a brief outline of the agenda. So I want to talk a bit about what Locus Tech is, um, some back background about the project, um, brief architecture overview, and then really diving into how to use Locus Tech um, and how you can actually use it. So I'm going to try and run a few interactive demos and hopefully the, the demo guards will be with us and everything's working. Um, then also talk a bit about the Locus Tech internals because uh, it's written in Python and, and I think there's some, some nice uh, details we can share about that. Uh, and then also talk a bit about some advanced usage um, and features and, and happy to, to take some questions towards the end. Um, so just a quick intro and background, um, sort of the context of where we're operating is um, maybe just get a, get a quick show of hands, who of you are actively involved in cloud development, say with AWS, for example? Okay, so that's the um, majority, I would say, of, of, of the audience, so 75% probably. Um, so what we're seeing a lot is that the cloud is great, right? It's very scalable, it's very performant, but sometimes the, the dev loop can be quite uh, slow and tedious, right? So you need to deploy some changes to the cloud to wait for um, you know, the result, see if it fails or if it runs, um, and then kind of do another deployment and see if that works. So kind of slowing you down in your, in your quick cycles that are kind of critical. Also, if you look at things like remote debuggability, if you have a red build in your CI pipeline, how can you actually replicate that to the local machine? Um, and then ultimately also the, the aspect of managing lots of different dev accounts for your um, organization, right? If you maybe uh, an SRE team or a DevOps team that needs to provide and provision all these AWS accounts can become quite a bit of an overhead and also costly. So that's kind of the context of where we operate and what local stack um, is and brings to the table is a what we call a fully functional local cloud stack. So you can literally develop your uh, AWS applications on the local machine, um, even offline in some cases. So I've actually been doing some work on the flight here, um, literally developing some sample apps um, while being offline, which is, which is quite nice. So it ships as a, as a Docker image, um, reasonably easy to install, um, and has support for some 50 to 60 AWS APIs right now. We'll go more into those. Um, so different compute um, services, various databases, uh, messaging, and also some more sophisticated exotic APIs. Um, so we'll talk a bit more that, about that in the, in the course of the presentation. So the, the kind of 10,000 feet view of, of what we want to achieve is that, you know, if, if your application, this blue box here, is kind of moving through different stages from the local development machine throughout CI, CD, uh, all the way to production, then the application is just talking to these, to these API endpoints, um, not really knowing that it's just sort of talking to these emulated endpoints in the local uh, context and in, in a CI system uh, before actually moving to, to production. So it's really about providing these gray boxes here on this image that really are the emulated um, actual AWS services that are just running on the local machine. Um, so um, you might be asking why local? Um, so um, a lot of people are generally asking like, why would you even like, bother doing this and um, so what we're hearing in the, in the space is that it, it can help um, just keeping control over your environment. People like to have things like locally attach a debugger in an IDE, um, just have like quicker iterations and cycles, um, just the speed of development, um, reduced management overhead and also removed restrictions. So if may maybe some of you are working in, a, in an environment where it's hard to even get access to a cloud um, account, then it can be very easy to get started and also just experiment with, with these cloud APIs without having any costs associated. There's also some interesting discussions on Hacker News. You can maybe check them out, some of the pros and cons of, of, of local cloud development. Um, so a bit of a, um, the history of the project, so it started as an open source project um, actually quite, quite some time ago already in 2017. Um, there was an initial, initial bump um, when it, it, it got some traction from a tweet by um, a Jeff Barr, the chief evangelist at AWS, uh, and then from then on it kind of was, was growing in the, in the open source. And in the initial phase was really just bootstrapping and getting the ideas out. Um, the, the medium phase, the, the, the middle part here is kind of the early adoption where people started using it more and more. And now we're sort of entering the, what we call growth phase because it's now really taking off and, and getting real. So local stack is now also a, a company and there's a team behind it and we're now actually um, seeing a lot more innovation happening in that, in that space. And also, if, if you happen to have been using local stack in the past, um, I'd encourage you to take a look at it uh, now again with a fresh view, because it's very different um, today to, to what it was uh, in the past. Um, 
Yeah, not, not going to go into too much detail, but um, it's, it's essentially a very frequently used um, um, uh, system. So we were also able to, to uh, in innovate uh, and add a lot of innovations to the, to the platform recently. Um, so for example, we improved the startup time. It previously took almost 10 seconds for local stack to start up. It's now basically one second immediately available. A new plugin system, a multi-arch build. If you happen to be using M1, um, you can now have an, an, an ARM64 um, um, a Docker image. So a lot of a lot of really cool things that were happening recently, and I'm um, going to go through some of them in, in in the talk as well. Okay, so the the very high level architecture, um, and I should mention, local stack is written in Python, so that's I think why it's also a good uh, fit for this conference. So the very high level o uh, overview, um, and this is slightly um, overloaded uh, chart here, but basically what it's trying to show is. Um, so you have a, a Docker container, which is basically where everything is running. Then we have the main um, local stack Python process, um, which has one canonical entry uh, port, which is draws port 4566. It's just a random port that we, that we chose. And then we have the runtime, which is basically consisting of a bunch of utilities for um, you know, process management, request parsing, plugin loading, and so on. And then the gateway, which is really the kind of the dispatching logic that then forwards an incoming request to the to the corresponding service implementation. So, for example, we have a Lambda service provider, CloudFormation, Kinesis, basically for all these different AWS services, there's one service plugin. Um, and these these have their own internal logic. Some of them actually call um, or in, um, spawn new Docker containers, like Lambda, for example. It's, it's spawning new Docker containers. Um, some of them are actually um, uh, calling external processes. For example, Kinesis. We are we're using a, a third-party tool called Kinesis Mock, um, and um, so it's a very different type of. Um, uh, logic and there's also inter-service communication happening. For example, CloudFormation, which is like used to deploy these templates, CloudFormation is actually talking to all these other services in order to get the state and get the resources deployed. So this is kind of a very high-level um, goal um, overview, and the goal is to be lightweight, easy to use, and and uh, cross-platform compatible. That's why we chose Docker as the as the runtime. Um, just a, a short word on the on the service providers. So essentially, what we are doing these days is um, very much being driven by the API specifications. So AWS um, and all the other service um, cloud providers as well are providing detailed API specs about their, their, their APIs. And we actually use those API specs to generate um, stops and um, sort of interfaces for uh, in Python. So here, for example, on the right-hand side, we can see the, um, the API specs for the create function API in Lambda. Um, you can see all these uh, these details here. So it's basically the path, um, the method, um, the expected response code, and then what we what we generate here is basically the interface, which can then easily be implemented from from Python by the by the by the developer. Um, we make heavy use here of um, a library called Bodo Core, which is basically the AWS representation of these specs in Python code. Um, and each service keeps the state in memory. So it's, each service provider has sort of a basically a state container that's just um, uh, an in-memory ephemeral state of um, um, a representation of the state, um, which basically is uh, indexed by an account region service tuple, right? So you have this hierarchy of accounts in AWS, then you have regions, and then you have services, and those basically make up the mapping of of, um, of uh, identity to, to state. And then we have some common mechanisms for persisting that state also to disk and reload. I think I'm hearing some feedback, but hopefully it's going to be cool. Um, and yeah, as also mentioned, there's also some external service providers. For example, um, Kinesis is where we really sort of um, in the Docker container spin up a, um, a third party uh, 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 tool that we integrate, which is called a Kinesis Mock. And then basically, we just forward the request to that because that's the canonical implementation right now for, for Kinesis. Um, okay, so um, that was a very quick overview of the sort of uh, the, um, the architecture of, of LocustX. So what I would like to do now is just go into some, some demos and, and just show you how it works. Um, and what we're going to start with is just some very basic usage of LocustX. So we're going to start up LocustX and then run a few commands to create some S3 buckets, some SQS queues, um, putting some messages on the queue and just, just playing around a bit with the services. Um, so I have a terminal prepared here and so what I'm going to do, I'm going to start LocalStack in uh, in dev mode here. So it's the same as using as, as running it in, uh, in Docker, but we're just going to do uh, in dev mode. And then I'm going to go back to my I have a few samples prepared, and I hope this is actually you can read this also from the back. I'll maybe zoom in just a bit to make it. Sh 
the left hand side is just the local stack container output that's maybe not so super relevant but um, um, okay so now we can do take a look at the sample one um, and this has just a, a bunch of commands for um, really creating resources so the simplest one is for example creating a bucket and what you'll note, notice is that we have this um, AWS local command here that has the same sorry um, Okay, let's scroll down a bit. Uh, that has the same um, uh, API and the same interface as the AWS command line. So if you're familiar with the AWS command line, um, that has all the commands for interacting with the different services. Uh, and AWS local uh, is basically just uh, the same, the same uh, interface, but it just points to the local APIs. Okay, so we created a bucket. We can, uh, you know, create a file with some content, say hello world, and then we we put this file. We say it was local S3 copy, we copy that file, and you can already see that there's some output happening here, S3 put object. Um, so, and if we do a list on this on this particular bucket named test, um, then we see that the file is there. So really, really simple, kind of shows you how to how to interact with, uh, with the system. Uh, we can then also do things like creating a, a SQS queue. So SQS, SQS is the simple queuing service, um, essentially used for, for, for sending and receiving messages in AWS. And then we can um, we've just created the queue here, and now we can send a message to the queue. We get some of these attributes like the message body, um, MD5 hash, um, message ID, and so on. Um, and then we can also obviously um, receive the message with this command here, um, and we get back the, the message. So fairly fairly straightforward. This is just kind of hello world of, of how to interact with local stack. Um, okay, so hope that is clear so far to follow. Um, there's lots of um, configuration options um, that you can use. It's a highly configurable system. So um, there's various network configurations. You can configure the ports, Docker networks, and so on. Some service-specific configurations. Um, for example, you can inject certain latency if you want to uh, have, you know, if you want to emulate or simulate the real-world um, uh, um, environment that also um, happens in AWS. Sometimes there's some delays, right? So the resource creation takes some time. So you can actually simulate those and configure them in, in, the, in the system. Um, Lambda has a lot of configurations, how to mount the code into the Docker containers and so on. We'll, we'll share that in, in a second. Um, and also some more settings for debugging, log outputs, persistence, and, and, and more. So we, we tend to assume uh, sensible defaults for most of the configurations because we just want to make it really easy to use out of the box. Um, but if necessary, then you can actually um, configure the, um, the specific configs as well. Um, there's also a web user interface. I'm probably not going to go into too much detail, but there's also basically a way to, to browse these resources that you created on a local machine from a web UI. It's just a different representation of, of how to look at, at things. Um, okay, so um, it's kind of um, switching gears a bit and uh, going to a slightly more complicated um, a scenario. So uh, next one we want to look at um, S3 bucket notifications. So let's assume we have uh, an S3 bucket um, and we're basically going to use that bucket to push um, log files to it, right? So some JSON encoded log files. And what we want, then want to do is we want to have a, a, a Lambda function written in Python that's basically scanning these logs and checks if there's some critical messages in there. And if so, it actually puts them to an SQS queue, which can later then be consumed by, by a consumer. So fairly standard kind of producer-consumer um, example. And we've also prepared this now to run on local stack. Um, so switching back here again to my um, example. So I'm going to go to sample two. And so what we have here, this is actually implemented as a um, as a Terraform um, Terraform module or Terraform configuration. So some of you may be familiar with Terraform, but uh, just for for a quick um, refresher. So it's it's basically. So if you take a look at uh, main.tf, so Terraform is a way to, to specify resources um, that should get deployed uh, against, your, uh, against your cloud environment. Uh, it's just kind of a declarative way, infrastructure as code, um, that allows you to define these resources and not having to call each, each API individually, basically. So the, the way this looks in Terraform, you have these resource sections here. So for example, we have this S3 bucket that we just saw before, where we store the, the logs. Um, we have an SQS queue. Um, which is going to be called alerts queue. It also has some policy attached, um, an IAM policy. Um, there's a Lambda function, the one that we're going to be using to do the filtering of the logs. Um, and then some more IAM roles, um, just some general boilerplate that also needs to, be, needs to be generated as part of the Terraform configuration. And this piece here is the, the bucket notification. So here we're actually linking the, um, the, um, the S3 bucket with object created events. 
um, to uh, the lambda function. So whenever an object created is happening uh, in the S3 bucket, we call the lambda function. So maybe this is familiar to some of you. Maybe a quick show of hands who's been using Terraform, maybe or some of these, okay, yeah, almost the majority. So you're familiar with that as well. Um, okay, and again, we have a, a small wrapper script that is called TF local. So if I if I were to um, uh, run TF, so the process is always to do uh, Terraform init, which initializes the, um, the the project, downloads some modules, make sure that everything has a fresh state, um, and then once that's done, you if I were to run Terraform apply here. It will fail because I don't have AWS credentials configured on this machine. So it will tell me, "Hey, I don't know how to get the credentials. Please, please give me, you know, access to to AWS." Um, that's why what we have is a tool called uh, TF Local, which is again a small wrapper script that just deploys uh, this Terraform script against local stack. Uh, we can now do TF Local apply, and it will again call Terraform under the covers, and we now see that it's it's um, uh, it's suggesting these uh, these edits, right? So it's basically coming up with a plan that can then, then get executed um, against local stack. So we're just gonna say yes here. Um, and you can already see here now on the left-hand side that a bunch of um, uh, log output is, is starting to happen. Um, it's basically, so Terraform is now checking the state, what is already uh, uh, configured, creating a few resources, making sure that they are that they are de properly deployed. Just basically running a, a deployment loop um, to make sure that the, the state converges to the to the desired state. Um, and as you could see up here in the in the resource section or in the plan, it's all the resources that were defined uh, in the uh, in, this, in this configuration that we that we had before. There's actually a lot of more information in here because Terraform is is applying a lot of default values. If you don't specify them as part of your config, they will just get added here as well as as defaults. Um, okay. So especially S3 buckets, I think, are sometimes slower to deploy because they have some, some timeouts. Um, and once that's done, you can actually see now it's checking some object lock configuration for the S3 bucket. So a lot of, a lot of different calls now, now happening from, from Terraform. And yeah, now it's creating the bucket notification um, as well. And that is now complete. So we now have this, this um, stack deployed against local stack. Um, and we can now follow, if you remember again, the scenario was to put some log files into the bucket and then have the Lambda triggered from that. So we're gonna do that now. Uh, so we have uh, one of these log files prepared here. This is what they look like. Um, it's just got some you know, timestamp, message, CPU utilization, um, some CPU values. And we basically wanna say if the C CPU is higher than a certain threshold, then we want to trigger an alert, right? So fairly um, simple example for some, some log monitoring. Um, and what we can do now is um, can switch down here, um, go to sample two. You have my commands, my cheat sheet. Um, so we're gonna copy this file um, into the S3 bucket with this S3 copy command. And now what you can see here on the left hand side, the local stack is actually spawning the lambda function. And we already see some some output happening here. Um, now let's take a look at the at the actual lambda function. Um, it's doing the processing. Um, so again, if those of you who are familiar with um, with with uh, Lambda function at AWS, um, you have this simple interface here. You basically implement this handle function with an event in the context, uh, and then this gets automatically called by by the cloud provider or by local stack in this case. And what we're going what we're doing here in this Lambda is, is pretty simple. So we get the the records. And then we just um, loop over all the records that are in this um, in this log file, and then you have these thresholds here, right? So if it's higher than 90%, then we say it's a critical CPU utilization. Otherwise, if it's higher than 60%, it's high utilization. Um, and what we actually saw here in the output is that it's it's creating these um, warning critical messages for us already. So you already put these messages to SQS, and we can consume it from there. So a bit further down here, it's doing this SQS send message, so we can now actually consume the messages from there. So we're gonna do that here, um, oops. And just call this a receive message, um, which is basically, um, oops, okay, let's clue. I probably have the name spelled incorrectly. That's interesting. Um, let me just double check real quick. Classical. So if you look into, the, into our main TF, the queue name was alerts queue, name alerts queue, SQS uh, list queues. Ah, okay. 
So it's a slightly different name. Navigating here. Test Q1. Okay, yeah. So um, this was a slightly uh, different name here, but you get you get the idea that basically you can just get these messages from uh, from SQS and, uh, and and modify them. So what we can also do now is um, if we go back to our our lambda function here, we can actually make some 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 life changes. And I want to quickly show how this works and what this means. So let's assume we we now want to make some modifications to this lambda handler that we just defined before. Um, we have this mechanism that we call lambda hot reloading. So Essentially, you can make um, changes to the Lambda handler on the local file system, and it's automatically reflected in the uh, in the uh, in the the next time you invoke the Lambda function. So there's no way to or no need to redeploy the Lambda. Essentially, you can just make a change, run the invocation again, and it's automatically reflected. Um, we achieve this by putting some special um, bucket name that's called Thunder Local Thunder, uh, which is just basically indicating that this is just a local bucket where we use this mounting mechanism. Um, so if we go back here again to the to the handler, what we're going to do is um, just add some hello world and then also uh, uh, Euro Python 2020. Okay, and then if I just basically um, copy the same the same file as before, the log file to S3, it actually triggers the lambda function again. And we can now see that the, I hope you can actually read that from the back, but now the, the output is updated here with the, um, with the change which is made. So that's a fairly um, easy way to kind of iterate really quickly with your, with your setup and your, your Lambda functions um, while you're developing your local apps. Okay, so I hope um, that was um, not too rushed and, uh, and, and clear from, uh, from, from the demo. Um, speaking a bit more about uh, integration, so we already saw um, Terraform, and this is actually something that's really important to us to have all sorts of different um, tools that integrate with the local stack. Um, so Terraform, we already saw it. Um, there's also Pulumi and other infrastructures code framework. Um, the AWS CDK, we're going to look at that in a second. Um, maybe some of you are familiar with, with that as, as well. Um, the, the cloud development kit. Actually, maybe a quick show of hands again, who's been using Okay, so that's less, less people than with Terraform, but a few hands were raised, so um, we'll talk about, uh, about this in a second. And, and then there's also other things like obviously Docker, Compose integration, all dif like different application development frameworks like serverless or AWS SAM and also CI CD systems. So really try to have a very active ecosystem of, of, of how to integrate local stack into your, into your um, environment. Um, so talking a bit about the uh, the CDK, um, so this is kind of um, yet another way to define infrastructure. It works a bit differently than than Terraform. So basically, what what CDK uh, the way it works is that you have um, you define your infrastructure in a uh, in a programming language. It can be Python. It can also be TypeScript, Go, anything really. Um, and but it's basically just a declarative specification. You just create basically an object tree of what um, your your infrastructure should look like. And this then gets compiled, so it have a CDK synth step, which is a compiler that compiles it into a CloudFormation template. And CloudFormation is, is this um, YAML or JSON specification where you just have the resource declarations. And then there's the processor, which is really CloudFormation that um, if makes the, 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 the creation of the resources effective. And we also implement uh, CloudFormation in local stack. That's why it's, um, we can use CDK as well. Um, so again, demo time. So what we want to do now is take a look at um, something a bit more um, complicated application, <coughs> which is using AppSync. Um, so AppSync is an, an AWS API that's um, using GraphQL schemas, um, essentially. So you can define GraphQL APIs, uh, and then you have your um, query and mutation um, uh, sort of operations to query some data from a backend or, or, or add some data to a backend. And there's, there's different types of backends you can have. So for example, DynamoDB databases or RDS um, databases, or even you can even call Lambda functions or other things. But what we're gonna demo here is just uh, a GraphQL API that's connected to a DynamoDB basically. Um, and we're gonna just deploy the whole thing uh, against, against the local stack. Uh, all right, so this is um, sample number three. Sample three. I'm just gonna do, um, just for the sake of it, fresh start here. The instance, I'm gonna go here into my sample three folder, uh, and so now we can take a look at um, first of all what this uh, the CDK script looks like. I should probably do this here. Um, so it's the CDK. Um, so I think it's here in loop. Uh, need to start this very quick. 
Uh, okay, so the, the, the CDK script itself, the stack, it is actually written in TypeScript. Uh, could have been Python as well, but just to show the different languages. Um, so this has a, um, a class here, the CDK demo stack. Um, it's actually taken from one of the AWS samples, I believe. Um, and then it just has a bunch of different resources. So you have this AppSync, GraphQL API, um, and there is a schema associated with it. Um, the schema has certain definitions with the different types. Um, so basically we have a, a query operation and mutation, so we can basically uh, retrieve op, um, items from Dynamodb with all and get one, or we can save and delete items as well. So these are kind of the two different operations, query and mutation. Um, and then there is um, the actual Dynamodb table that's also part of the stack, right? So we need to create the table itself with the, the partition key, which is called, um, which is using um, some ID as a, as a name. Uh, and then, uh, and then also the data sources, which are basically connecting the DynamoDB table to the AppSync data source. So there's quite a bit of um, sort of boilerplate involved and in kind of connecting the different pieces. Then there's also this concept of resolver in AppSync, which is basically making sure that we actually have um, the, the the schemas or the the, um, the types in the, in the GraphQL schema associated with actual um, actions that we can run against the the, the endpoints. So so the DynamoDB table uh, database in this case. So you can see it's a it's a reasonably um, large and, and and also non-trivial example. Um, so what we want to do now is um, deploy this against local stack. And as you could have guessed, there is a, a CDK local command uh, that we can use, uh, which will basically uh, not apply. This is deploy in this case. CDK local deploy. So what this does now basically uh, it looks at this. Um, at the script that we just saw, it creates um, the Terraform templates, and now it's basically running this, this Terraform um, deployment look against, uh, against local stack. And you can see a bunch of output that's happening here. So I've enabled the debug logs here. Um, and so basically, um, it's just making sure that all the different resources are now deployed. Everything that we saw in the, in the example before, right? So the DynamoDB table, this GraphQL schema, the, the API, all the different pieces. Um, and now we can actually run um, um, commands against this. So it's now deployed. So again, my cheat sheet here is run as h. Um, so we can now, first of all, list the GraphQL APIs. So this was just created by us. Um, it has the, the, the basic information. You can actually also get um, an endpoint here, a local endpoint that can be directly invoked um, with the GraphQL API that was created, and also a WebSocket endpoint if you want to do real-time communication. Um, then um, yeah, what we can do is we can we can get get the API ID of the API which is created. So this is just API ID. Um, yep, it's just an identifier. Um, then we can also receive the API key because that's part of the. I'm actually not sure if this was. Okay, I need to. Yeah, um, API key. Uh, this is just sort of um, a generated key that we can use to to invoke the API. And now we can actually start running some curl requests against it. Um, and Oops, looks like I'm having some issue with the line wrapping here. So we're going to run a curl request that um, passes the API key as a as a header, and it does a um, the payload is a query operation where actually we do a mutation to save a new item that's called test one. Um, and as you could see on the left hand side, it was actually triggering some some DynamoDB put item calls here in the background. So again, like we, we make a rec an HTTP request to this a to this um, GraphQL endpoint, it detects kind of which API is associated, looks up the resolver, and then creates the um, request against DynamoDB in the background. Um, and now we've we've added this item here. Um, we can add another item and just get the the item ID here. Um, oops, so this is test two. So then we have an, an item ID that was returned. Item ID, yeah. Uh, and then we can also retrieve this via the, the query part of the API, not the mutation, but the query. So we're gonna just pass this particular um, um, item ID to, to the get get one operation, and then this should actually uh, return us the, the item. Again, doing the full uh, round trip against the DynamoDB database and really allowing you to, to interact with these resources in a very, very easy kind of fashion. Um, okay, so that was a bit sort of um, slightly more um, complex example, lots of moving pieces and kind of shows nicely again how to, to iterate quickly. If you wanted to make some changes, for example, in, in the schema logic here, it's really quick to, to make changes and deploy them again uh, uh, against the local, local instance. All right, so um, 
that's um, sort of um, the first part of the demo. So I want to talk a bit more also uh, about the uh, the Python internals because I think that's uh, maybe interesting um, for especially for you all with uh, with you, with the Python background. Um, so there's a couple of different um, patterns that we've um, sort of established along the way. The project has been around for quite some time and we've, we've been getting a lot of different requirements. It is also, the code base has um, grown organically over time and we've also refactored a lot of it in the last couple of couple of months and, and the last year. But basically some of the, the highlights I wanna, I wanna mention here. So one is SSL socket multiplexing. So one use case we often have is that we wanna expose um, our port 4566, both as HTTP and HTTPS. Um, so in fact, if I go back here, if I do a curl on localhost um, 4566 um, and the health at the end, I get the, the health endpoint information. I can also do the same with, um, yeah, unfortunately here I need to specify the, okay. So it's also an HTTPS um, uh, endpoint. There's also, you can actually also, there's a, a valid certificate that we use, uh, which is called localhost.localstack.cloud. Um, then you don't even need to specify the, um, the SSL. Uh, so that's actually a valid SSL certificate for localhost. So yeah, so basically multiplexing SSL traffic and non-SSL traffic over the same socket is something that is just uh, very, very useful. Uh, and the way that we do this um, with this um, very simple mechanism here, we basically um, uh, wrap the SSL, uh, SSL context, um, SSL, so uh, uh, SSL socket uh, class, which is basically the factory that's creating new SSL sockets. Uh, and we basically, um, we, we, we say that this, we override it with a duplex socket and the duplex socket essentially um, makes a peak um, on the first five bytes of each connection and then checks whether the bytes are in a certain range. If they are um, less than 32 or higher than 127, it's a good indication that uh, it's, it's not in a regular HTTP traffic, it's, it's most likely SSL. There's also some libraries who can actually achieve that, but we just happen to you know use this because it's been serving us pretty well. And yeah, it's, it's just a nifty thing that has come, come up uh, over the years. Um, actually curious to hear also your experiences maybe after the, the talk if you have some, some good ex um, solutions for some of these problems. But yeah, so this is SSL so socket multiplexing. Um, the other thing I want to point out is, uh, is plugin loading. So um, by now lo local stack is, is a pretty sizable code base, several hundred lines of, uh, hundred thousand lines of code. Um, and previously um, we were basically essentially loading the entire, importing the entire um, code tree uh, on startup, which was, um, um, terrible, frankly, like the, it took very long to, to really start it up, even on some, some, some new hardware. So what we're now doing, and I'd really like to encourage you to take a look at this project um, called Plux. We actually uh, open sourced it. It's, um, it's a very nifty piece of software, and what it basically does, it's a, pl a plugin mechanism it's using the, the setup tools entry point um, mechanism. So setup tools is the, is the packaging mechanism when you publish something to PyPy, for example. Um, and basically um, what you see here in, in the bottom left corner is part of the, the entry point specification of the local stack um, uh, PyPy um, uh, um, package. I hope you can read it in the back, but basically it's it's defining some, the service name, ACM colon default, which means the default implementing um, implementing provider for the ACM service should be looked up in this module, right? So, so we have this information basically pre-import, so we don't need to import any code um, uh, in order for us to know um, which, which modules do we need to load in order to instantiate a, a, a service provider, a plugin. So this is, and, and I believe this is something that's um, quite uh, useful for, for other projects with, lar with large code bases if you have the this issue of, of lazily loading code um, as plugins. So I'd really uh, encourage you to take a look at that. So if there's two things um, to take away from this from this talk, local stack is great and Plux is great. So <laughs> hopefully, um, hopefully I, I was able to get that across. Um, now it's it's really it's it's to a total game changer for us because it's really um, like the the startup time is really sub second now, and we just do this lazy loading, which is uh, extremely powerful. Um, okay, so that the next um, common um, um, sort of a pattern we, we were seeing we're doing is, is uh, serialization of state uh, using the pixel library. Um, so as I mentioned before, the service providers by default have just ephemeral states in memory. When you tear down the instance, restart, it's, it's all gone. But there's also a serialization mechanism. Uh, we use uh, dill, uh, which is kind of um, builds upon pickle and adds some more functionality. Um, 
but is also um, basically adding some, some more functionality on top of it. So one example is, for example, if you have um, um, serialization primitives like locks or queues, um, they would, it's problematic if you reload them from persistent state because they might be acquired. Um, so we basically make sure that um, when we reload the state, we just go over the, the entire um, object graph and reinitialize things like queues and, uh, and, um, and locks with kind of new values, um, with new objects, so they can actually be acquired again. Um, so that is also something that we've, that we've come across quite a bit. Um, the other point is runtime code patching. Um, so we, um, we use a variety of, of third-party libraries um, that we depend upon, and sometimes we have the, the, the requirement to just change things, like minor modifications that need, need to be done. Um, and um, instead of always creating a fork and making the modifications there, we apply monkey patching in quite a few places. Um, so basically the way it looked look like is on the, on the right hand side here you have your original function, um, you keep a reference to the original function, you assign a new function, you can call the original function in the new function and then basically update the result. It's fairly st straightforward. But what we did is uh, just introduce a add patch uh, decorator, which makes it very easy. You can uh, apply it to, the, to a patched function and it passes in the original instance from the, uh, of the function that you're patching. Um, so again, something that's that's been very useful in in, in the context of working with third-party libraries that you need to need to patch. Um, process management is another one. So there's a lot of um, sort of um, abstractions for, for 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 process management. Um, so we have a server abstraction, and then for example, there is a, a Docker container server uh, class, and then as a proxy Docker container server. So it's a quite a bit of a hierarchy. So the proxy Docker container server, for example, creates a, an SSL proxy within local stack, which spins up also an external Docker container and then basically proxies the, the request through. Um, so it's just helpful for just maintaining the life cycle of external processes and containers. Um, and also um, in terms of testing, so we, we use PyTest quite extensively. Um, and for example, fixtures, um, when we create uh, AWS, SDK clients, uh, um, then we we basically configure them with the endpoint URL. So if they're um, if we're running against local dev, we can set the, the endpoint URL. Otherwise, if it's against prod, we can just use the, the default um, border clients. This is very helpful for us to do what we call parity tests when we uh, actually run our integration tests both against um, the real cloud against AWS and then a second time against local stack to really sh see what the, the difference is. And ideally, there is uh, they are identical. Okay, I think I need to um, take a look at the time already. So, um, yeah, again, uh, PyTest, um, also um, resource cleanup is also something that's extremely valuable and helpful. So PyTest is a great, great library for testing. There's one more thing I wanted to briefly share, um, which is one, um, uh, one feature that we're now um, sort of releasing very soon. Uh, it's called uh, Local Cloud Pods. Basically, it's a way to um, take a persistent snapshot of your instance. So as mentioned before, by default, when you when you start local stack, um, the state is ephemeral. But there's um, this new feature now, and I can briefly show this. I think this should still be within um, within time. Um, so I'm just gonna show a few sample four um, commands here. Okay. Um, so basically, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create some states. Um, Create an S3, um, S3 bucket, we're going to create an SQSQ. Okay, we've seen this before. So now what we can do is we have this new uh, command local stack pod, which is uh, using the local stack command line, and we can now commit this state. So we can basically, similar to, to git commits, we can actually do a commit of this state um, to um, the pod number um, one. Actually, before I do this, I want to make sure that the, uh, the local pod was three years. So I, um, I commit this state uh, into the pod one. Um, and again, a cloud pod is basically a, a notion of uh, keeping the state of an instance. And once it's been created, I can now do an, an inspect on this pod. So the inspect is basically um, showing us, this is kind of an, an interactive end curses um, uh, CLI here. Um, basically, you can see the S3 buckets that were created and the SQSQ, right? So that's basically the content of this, buck, uh, of this cloud pod. Um, now what we can do is we can create some, some more state. So let's also create some uh, SNS topic and an IM user. Um, and then we um, basically uh, update the pod, right? So we do another commit operation, pod commit. Um, again, state was successfully committed into a new commit. And then we can do another inspect and then see uh, the state has changed, right? So now additionally, we also have this SNS topic here and the IAM user that was just created. Um, and now the cool part of it is now, okay, if I now restart local stack, um, so, you know, we, we're back into 
um, we, we just restarted the instance. And now, since the state is ephemeral, um, if I do a list queues here, it's, it's empty, right? There's no queues because we just restarted. Um, but now we can do the pod inject operation, um, which basically injects the state that we were previously committing. Um, and now if I do another um, list here, um, it actually lists the queues and all the other um, sort of resources that were in there. So this is kind of a bit of a sneak preview of sort of how we envision sort of the state management and like really treating this, the internal state of local stack as almost like Git objects that you can easily you know share and push and pull and all that. Um, this is just sort of a, a quick overview of, of what uh, what these operations look like, uh, which is saw this pod commit, which from the local instance uh, pushes it to a local uh, cloud pod storage, and you can also push that to a remote backend, um, obviously. Okay, so. Um, it looks like I'm running a bit out of time, and I want to just spend one second for a very quick announcement. So we actually have a version 1.00 of LocusDeck coming up. It's actually scheduled for uh, release this week, um, if all goes well, actually today. So we have a lot, a lot of uh, cool new features and optimizations in, in the product, um, huge set of new and advanced features. So we really want to um, create, hopefully, a bit of hype to, to give it a try and, and test it out, and looking forward to getting the feedback. We also have a, a short, if we can do a short promo, uh, promo here, um, if you haven't used LocusDeck before or you have used it already, um, there's a small promo. So if you basically post us on, uh, on LinkedIn or, or Twitter um, uh, and just tag us with uh, LocusDeck and EuroPython, uh, you'll basically get uh, a bunch of uh, free, uh, free licenses for your team, uh, three, I think free, three licenses for three months uh, in your account. Um, so hopefully if you, if you want to check it out and, and give it a try, if all goes well, then this afternoon we should be ready to hit the, hit the release button. Um, so the team is currently quite, quite excited and, and working on this um, right now. Okay, so I think um, that's a wrap. Um, sorry, it was um, going a bit over time, but again, um, I think what we've um, we've seen that local stack, uh, local cloud development is is feasible and also enjoyable. Uh, it, it enables very quick dev and test loops um, locally. Python is a great language for our purposes, um, so it's it's dynamic, um, has the ability to do monkey patching and like a lot of really cool um, optimizations that we were able to introduce that were very specific to our, our problem, right? The, the lazy code loading with the plugins of plugs and um, and uh, yeah, and the future directions are that we want to look into things like hybrid scenarios, so kind of blurring the boundary between between local and remote. So it's not not always black and white, right? You might have some some shades of gray of some resources are remote, some are local. We also want to dig more into state management based on cloud pods that I was just showing before. And also we're releasing now a local stack extensions mechanism, which is essentially a way to really easily plug in uh, extensions into the, into the system. So adding new service providers or also doing things like intercepting all the service calls and doing some logging that goes to some, some downstream system, for example. So we'll be very curious to, to get your feedback and um, also your questions now if you have any. So thanks a lot. That's it from my side. Yep, there was a question here. Yeah, so there's an, there's an open source version, a community version of LocusDeck, um, which has um, the core set of, of services that uh, you use, uh, Lambda, DynamoDB, like I think almost 30 services. And then there's also some, some pro extensions, we call them, um, that include some more advanced features and the licenses would be for that. Yeah, so the question was whether the, the CloudFormation or Terraform scripts are the same or need some modifications. Um, they are, for the most part, can be literally identical. Um, so uh, these days you can take a lot of um, AWS provided samples, CloudFormation and deploy them directly into LocalStack. There's a few um, minor subtle differences when it comes to endpoints, for example, which we use for the local uh, domain names and a few, few minor details, but it's, for the most part, it's actually really identical resources you can deploy. Yeah, thanks. Uh, cool project, and uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, so do you do lifecycle process management? Uh, is it this Linux uh, user space and Linux containers? Is there a way to add additional uh, lifecycle management? Uh, for example, if I wanted to deploy virtual machines. 
Yeah, so the question was, is, is there a way to extend the, 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 the life cycle mechanism for the external process? Um, it is certainly something we could add as part of this, this hierarchy I was showing. So we, we, we tried to introduce abstractions from the very sort of ground up. Okay, what is a server? It has certain characteristics like a port, usually some endpoint, and you can de derive from that. Docker is one tree of this of this uh, class hierarchy, but I think we can also inter integrate something for virtual machines, as you mentioned, right? Where you can actually enable the life cycle of VMs, definitely. Yeah, great point. Any more? Yeah, more questions? Uh, yes, it is. So that is actually something that is part of our um, the upcoming release that I just mentioned. So we, we now have um, multi-account support. So previously, basically, you could only have multiple regions, um, but now you can have multiple regions and multiple accounts, and also cross-account um, IAM enforcement, basically. Yes, please. Yeah. 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 The question was if there's an easy way to integrate a mock, for example, like Textract or something that's not currently available in LocalStack. I think the extension mechanism that I was mentioning before, maybe we can take it as a follow-up, is a great way to essentially get new extensions into uh, into LocalStack. We're actually gonna. Um, uh, demonstrate this with our V1 release based on a, on a Stripe API emulator. So you can plug in a, a Stripe API emulation. And I think you can apply a very similar approach, for example, for Textract and, uh, and other APIs. In fact, Textract is also on our roadmap, but if you want to do it yourself, then the extensions mechanism would be great, I think. Yeah. Is there any more questions maybe from the um, online? I think there was maybe some online Q&A. Or any other questions? OK. Yeah. All right, thank you so much for your time and it was great, um, great conference. See you all.